Okay. Uh, so first, I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and a special thank you to Ali Giorsi from the Food Shed Network, Meg Horgan from Connecticut Food System Alliance, and Sally Milius of Grow Wyndham uh, for helping us plan this webinar series. Um, unfortunately, Meg is not able to join us tonight, so please bear with us as we've adjusted some of the programming. Um, we did a lot, an hour and a half for this conversation, um, but based on our last webinar, we might get out a little bit early, so Thanksgiving miracle, maybe? I don't know. We'll see. Um, but so I'm to introduce myself, I'm Sydney Clements. I am the director of the Wyndham Community Food Network, uh, and I'll be facilitating the discussion tonight uh, along with Allie. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to provide a brief overview of how this webinar series uh, came to be. It's one of the results of our Rooting Deep and Scaling Up project, uh, and that was made possible by a regional food system partnership grant through the USDA. So over the past two years, we've been convening stakeholders throughout the state to identify ways to strengthen Eastern Connecticut's food system, with the core mission of the work being to increase economic viability for farmers and equitable access to fresh food for individuals, uh, particularly low-income consumers. Over the first year, we focused on the rooting deep portion of our project, uh, which involved extensive community surveying and interviews with producers, consumers, retailers, and emergency food providers. Uh, these results were then compiled into a landscape assessment where we identified recurring needs and opportunities to improve our food system. You can find this under the resource section of our website, uh, windomfood.org, and I'm also pasting a link into the chat right now for it. Um, after our landscape uh, assessment was published last December now, um, in year two, we looked at scaling up. And so the partnership broke into working groups around different leverage points that we identified in year one to develop projects that could uh, address these needs. Uh, you can find a list of all of the partners that participated uh, in this on the invitation uh, to this webinar and also in that landscape assessment document. We believe right now that we are currently operating in two different food systems. So there is this emergency food system space and also this foodie space of successfully thriving food co-ops and farmers markets throughout um, the state supporting local farmers. We see pay what you can models as a real chance to bridge the gap between these two spaces where those who can afford to pay more uh, do so to and it's off, used to offset the price for those who would not normally be able to afford it, um, while also removing the financial burden on the farmer, um, where right now a lot of times farmers maybe feel obligated or it's this unspoken thing to uh, donate their produce at a lower cost uh, to provide food access to low-income uh, individuals or food insecure community members, um, which really isn't financially sustainable for anyone involved, uh, especially the farmer's business. Uh, and if they go out of business, who's going to feed us? Um, and while we're really excited about the concept of combining these two food systems into one, uh, we know it's not an original idea. Um, and there's been so many organizations that are already doing this work. So rather than reinvent the wheel, uh, we developed this series to bring together those already working in these models to educate us on the success and challenges of operating them as we begin our own journey of building one in Eastern Connecticut. Um, this is the second of these two webinars. The first one focused on sliding scale cafe models, and this one is will be used to highlight sliding scale grocery stores. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Allie to speak a little bit about the CFSA and their role in this project. Great, um, hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here and thank you to our speakers, Ben and Sila for your time tonight. Um, as Sydney said, Meg, unfortunately, is unable to be with us this evening. And so I am going to just offer a quick uh, snapshot of CFSA um, work. Meg is the um, project um, coordinator and director of CFSA. And so on her behalf, 
CFSA is a network of food system actors in the state who share a goal of creating a just and sustainable food system, policy advocacy, tracking legislation that impacts the food system and developing the state's food system network are central to their work. Um, they're working uh, with network members to create a state food action plan, which would center food justice and climate resilience. Uh, they're collected, uh, connected to local level food system planning, like the Eastern Connecticut Partnership, which is a convening partner for, for this uh, event tonight, and the Hartford Advisory Commission on Food Policy, as well as connecting with regional work uh, by way of the New England Food System Planners Partnership. Uh, the New England uh, Planners Partnership is advocating for 30 by 30, um, a goal of producing 30% of food consumed by New Englanders in New England by 2030. And I know Meg, as well as Martha Page, have been very um, influential in that, in that project and initiative, and I believe represent Connecticut um, within, within the context of that partnership. So developing a food action plan uh, in partnership with individuals and organizations would align our goals around sustainable food production, uh, just and equitable food system employment and community food security and local regional food sourcing. So the plan would include data and matrix that illustrate the food system as it is today. Uh, so offering a food system baseline a collective vision rooted in food justice and strategies to realize that vision together. These could include city policies, participatory budgeting, community programs and services, and state and or federal policy advocacy. And I'll just add um, that Connecticut is the only New England state without a food action plan. And so, um, uh, you know, more incentive um, to, uh, to hone, to hone in on that. I'll turn it back to Sydney, where we'll yeah. introduce our speakers. Yeah, uh, so we've gotten all the housekeeping stuff out of the way and we can move into the exciting discussion portion of our night. Um, I'm really excited to announce our two speakers. Uh, we have uh, Cela Graham, who is the co-founder, head buyer and community liaison of Rolling Grocer in Hudson, New York and uh, Ben Dubow, uh, the executive director, director of Forge City Works in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, on the agenda, we're planning to ask them a series of questions um, and then we will op uh, open it up to a broader participant Q&A at the end, um, but feel free uh, to throw any questions you have in the chat uh, as we go and we can uh, answer them at the end. Um, so I'm going to have each of our guests start by briefly introducing themselves. Uh, Sila, if you'd like to start. Sure. Hi, everyone. And thank you so much for get, getting my name right. It's a little tricky when people see it. They want to pronounce every letter and it's the H is silent. So it's Sila, like singing. It's um, it's in Psalms. So it's uh, pause, take notice, and crescendo. Those are the meanings. People always ask me so I figure I can get a house cleaning out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, so... <laughs> We started our food journey um, in 2018, but prior to that, we did a lot in our community. Uh, one of the things that we found really important about food justice work is you have to listen. You can't just assume you're gonna just, we don't have all the money to be a Trader Joe's or to be a Whole Foods. So listening sessions are the key to any 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 community trying to, to, to conquer or even come in between this food aggregate that we have of the haves and haves not, right? Um, I am a mother of seven. Um, I, I also have two other small businesses that I run. I'm a tax preparer, a virtual tax preparer, and a mobile notary. So I deal with a lot of access issues already in my other two lines of work and a lot of service work. Um, the town that I live in is really, I would want to say it's similar to the UN model. We have, I think, about 70 countries living in Columbia County and in Hudson specific, which is the seat of the county. Um, and so we, we thought about different ways to uh, meet everyone's needs and to also bring about food justice and food access uh, in a really, really intuitive way. Thank you. Thank you. And Ben? Well, good evening. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this. I'm really excited about this conversation and really excited to learn uh, from this community. So 
Uh, I am the executive director at Ford City Works in Hartford, Connecticut. Been there just uh, about 18 months, so it's still a relatively new position for me. Our core mission as an organization is focuses on culinary job training for people with barriers to employment, as well as food access. And so historically for us, uh, we've run a um, an urban farmer's market for many years uh, where we've been able to double SNAP benefits and do other things. We're located right in the Frog Hollow uh, neighborhood of Hartford, which um, historically has been one of the more impoverished neighborhoods within Hartford and is certainly understood as a food swamp as many of the neighborhoods are uh, in Hartford. Hartford has an ongoing challenge like many urban areas of uh, really lacking full service groceries within the city. Most people who live in Hartford have to leave the city uh, in order to shop, um, which obviously creates a lot of that um, split that we've already talked about, right? So like people with vehicles can do that much more easily than people who don't have that. And so we are developing a concept. It's not open yet. Actually, we're hoping to open in early 2024, um, a small neighborhood grocery store that will have a sliding scale model, a means tested model um, for how uh, for the pricing piece of it. So we were going to focus on fresh produce as local as possible, meats, dairy, wholesome foods, ingredients. Um, my chef, uh, my background is as a chef. So we like to talk about that is it's like not the processed foods, but the ingredients you would use to just make food. And the idea of the means testing is we're using a self certification process and that people will certify uh, for discounts up to 50%, 25%. Everyone who does the certification will get at least 3%, but the store will also be open to the to the general public and people who just wanna walk in um, and, and spend their money there. So the idea is to really destigmatize the whole process of fighting food insecurity, providing food access. Um, we're working with our POS, our point of sales folks who are using Toast to create a system where people will simply swipe uh, their membership card and will automatically apply the, rel the relevant discount. So there doesn't, no one has to know, right? Who's on the discount, who's not, all those kind of things. So the idea is to create a real neighborhood community store that has um, great product that everyone will want to shop at. I live about four minutes away and I currently have to leave Hartford to get my food or use Instacart. This will now become the primary place that I shop as well. And so uh, that's what we're trying to build out is something that's very community community centered um, and meets really a variety of needs around food access, but is also part of a broader strategy to fight food insecurity. And I should say just in general, as, as we look at Hartford's kind of challenge around food access, we don't think that this uh, replaces the need for a full service grocery store in Hartford, um, but that's an ongoing project and, and it's a complicated one for a variety of reasons. So the idea is to create this as a model that might be both scalable and reproducible. And so there are actually already a few nonprofit profits within Hartford and other neighborhoods, particularly in the North End, who are learning from us in live time um, as we're implementing, as we're building out, as we're doing this, so that hopefully that can jumpstart other people to start similar models. Great. Thank you. Um, so for our question portion of this, we're hoping to kind of pose a series of questions um, in around content relationships, equity, and values, um, and kind of have you guys ping pong back and forth between uh, your, while you answer. So going into content, I know both of you guys are in different stages of development with this, um, but really how are you guys kind of diving into this work? How is this uh, need identified? Why this model as opposed to something else within the community? Well, I could say for uh, Rolling Grocer 19, since we are, actually running and have been established, um, <clears throat> the need came out of the realization that even if you have EBT or WIC, <clears throat> those are just supplements to homes. It is not, um, and then it also is pretty um, narrow in scope in terms of what, who can qualify, how they qualify. Their tests and their needs assessments are a lot more stringent and usually take a lot longer. Whereas Rolling Grocer 19's uh, FPS, which is Fair Pricing System Model is immediate. Um, when we got started, we got a grant to fund us initially from Berkshire Taconic Foundation, which was a half a million dollars. And a part of that was to do listening sessions to gauge the community and determine how we would use the tool of food access. So the first tool we used was to um, institute a needs assessment, which we did listening sessions in the community. And then we also did um, just a feel as to what department folks felt the most um, lacked in terms of all of their variations of shopping and everyone said fish. So what we did is we, we, we located uh, local fish mongers and fish distributors 
And we started to just like sell fish right on the streets in Hudson. Um, and we did that using our fair pricing system, which is uh, blue, orange, and, and green. And so how we determined that it was through the listening sessions as well. And so we talked about sliding scale, which didn't seem to be as concrete. So we, we, talk, we talked about percentages and what it would look like based on percentages of households. So households usually fall into three categories. Either you're in severe need, you're in middle need, or you're, you have a uh, high to no need, right? So the blue, the, the blue, orange, and green addresses all of that. So blue initially was wholesale prices. So if we got this jar of honey <clears throat> from a local distributor, which is local, and they sell it at $10, we pass it on to the blue tier customer at $10. They did not pay any kind of fuel fee, any kind of markup. There was nothing added to this but the product. That is our blue tier. Um, and then we had our orange tier, which was in the middle. So if you're in the orange and you wanted to buy this, this would maybe cost you $12.50, $13. So it's a markup of between 20 to 25%, depending on department, depending on perishabilities and a few other burials we put in there. And then there's a green tier, which is retail prices, what you would normally find this at, at your local farmer's market or at your grocery store, if your grocery store ever decided to sell local products, which they never do. So that set the bar for what people could access. We do not have a, um, it's honor system based. So when you come in, Ben's gonna come in and shop at Rolling Grocer because it's four minutes from his house. Um, we're going to ask him, are you a member with us? And you're going to say no. And you're going to say, what, what does it cost to be a member? Nothing. The only cost that you need to have is between a 30 mile square range of our zip code. And um, that's pretty much it. We ask for a name, an, an email address, a phone number, and, a, and our zip code. Um, we used to have an age requirement, but that was for a grant that we no longer received. So we got rid of it. Um, so basically, you would self-select based on a few criteria. So there's household size, income and then social constructs of how you access food. Now we might say, what the hell is that? <laughs> I'll slow it down for you. So within every person that's in blue, orange, or green, there's realities as to why people are in blue, orange, or green. So you, a person might say, well, I don't have an income, so I'm, I'm automatically in blue. Well, let's look at that. Why are you in blue? Are you in blue because you're a trust fund person that doesn't want to work? Are you in blue because you're disabled and you, you have children and you can't work? Are you in blue because you're a student and so you're you know, you're just not working right now because that's the limbo that you're in. Are you, are you in blue because you're in a restricted income because you're a senior? So every blue criteria has a caveat of asking why the blue, why the orange, and certainly even why the green, right? Because we've had people that signed up in green just to kind of get it out the way, not really paying attention. And when we ask them these questions further on down the, the, the membership, it triggers them to say, oh, I'm actually not in green or yeah, I am in green because, you know, I also want to give back. I want to pay this forward. I might be in orange, but I want to give something back. I want to be a private donor or an on, on-demand donor. So they become an on-demand donor by signing up in the green tier. Um, those are the things that give us the impetus to continue the food access work. We use tools so that fair pricing system is our first tool. The second tool we, we, were, we came to came to us by way of Fork and Field, and that is our Double Up Food Bucks program, which is tied into our fair pricing system, but more into the EBT structure. So basically it says that if you're an EBT recipient, you automatically qualify for Double Up Food Bucks. And what is Double Up Food Bucks? Double Up Food Bucks says if you buy groceries, so I have a lot of honey here because we don't really do sugar anymore, so different types of honey. Um, <laughs> if you buy groceries, uh, and here's another grocery stuff is great. Um, if you buy groceries, every dollar you spend on groceries goes towards a dollar towards fresh fruit or produce. So you buy meat, you buy cheese, you buy dairy, you buy bread. And let's say now you need to buy this, this amazing broccoli rob, peppers, onions to make all the things, right? Those things you would get for free because as you earn, you get monies towards those free items. It's on a card. You get $20 every time you shop. So the, the cap is $20 and you can shop every day. So if you come in every day and you buy 15 bucks worth of stuff, you're pretty much going to have, you know, about $15 times however many times you shop in double up food bucks to go towards fresh fruit or produce when you use your EBT card. And that can work independently from EBT. So that means if you're out of benefits by the 15th of the month, guess what? You have, e you have double up food bucks that you can now use to buy potatoes, onions, broccoli, carrots. If you want to become a vegan at that point at the 15th of the month, you're good to go. We also provide another tool, which is our, um, uh, it's, it's our curbside, but the curbside becomes a tool because of access. We know that not everyone lives four minutes away. We know that every, not everyone has a ride. 
We know that sometimes it's even not walkable, um, especially in the winter months. So the curbside program allows for people to shop uh, online and even with EBT and get the food delivered to their doors. So that's how we 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 actually radicalize our um, our food program. Excellent. That's great. That's really cool stuff. Um, let me back up for us in terms of how we arrived at wanting to do this is I want to uh, first kind of really affirm uh, earlier what was said about the importance of listening. And so we really learn from the community that we're in and part of. So we've historically been in Frog Hollow. And so we've been doing work in that neighborhood now for, you know, about 15 plus years, including the urban farmers market. And as we got to know people shopping and, and the needs and how that you know, met the needs. We also realized the limitations of essentially three hours in the middle of the day on a Thursday for four months of the year. Um, and so we began to think about what it would look like to be able to provide uh, more food access more consistently to think through the food insecurity issue. Part of my background is I used to um, run a uh, community kitchen in a pantry in a neighboring uh, or close by in central Connecticut town. And there I began to ask some questions just about the whole process, right, of fighting food insecurity. And uh, and at the time, I actually just suggested the idea that we should close the pantry and open a food co-op. And I was uh, laughed out of the room uh, by senior staff and the board. Um, and so when I became the executive director here, it was kind of fun to be in a position where we could actually experiment and try that. Um, so we en didn't end up actually with a co-op model, but it kind of co-op principles. And, um, and that's kind of where we began to dream about what would a six day a week, open all day, normal hours kind of grocery concept look like. And again, in Hartford, it, it's so obvious what the issues are because this has been an ongoing issue and debate and discussion for the last 10 or 20 years without a solution yet. And so it also became from our perspective, um, what do we do as a stopgap measure for the community in the neighborhood that we're in and for the people we serve and our neighbors, uh, the people we care about um, and are involved um, in the work that we're already doing. So it really emerged in some ways very organically. And then um, there was a great partnership. Uh, we're actually working with Connecticut Food Share on how we develop this and, and, and work it out. Um, and they provided some funding for us that so they'd gotten through some federal grants. And so everything really began to fall into place for us to move forward with this experiment. So, and, and that's what I, I tell my staff every day and, and our supporters. It's, it's an experiment. We're going to learn as we go. I'm sure we'll make some mistakes. We'll try to adjust. So I love hearing about these other models because I'm making notes myself right now and um, and so, because we're going to learn as we go. But I, I do just think that uh, listening and, and you know, thinking through, you know, everything from what we stock and what hours we're open and, and how we facilitate the discount program and all those kind of things are just really important. And I think folks who are going to use the market will already have those answers in some ways. Great, that's wonderful. Um, <coughs> that I have lots of questions. Um, but before we get to questions, I want to move on to the next one um, in regard to relationships. And Ben, you just touched on this slightly. Um, but what are the relationships and networks that you depend on? Uh, what relationships does this work foster and do you hope uh, will help to build? And it's a great question. Oh, okay. um, yeah, Ben, if you want to continue, and then we'll go over to Sila. Sure. From uh, from our perspective, it's a lot of relationships, um, both with individuals and folks who live in the neighborhood, who are you know involved with us as well as you know our trainees. All really come from this neighborhood in the Hartford area, so we get to know them very intimately and, and significantly, and some of their barriers and issues and challenges. Um, but also, we work a lot with uh, Hartford Food Systems and. Uh, Hartford uh, Food Collaborative and other people who are in this work. And so it's allowed us to really um, learn from each other, look at different models, try to develop different ideas. The city itself has been super supportive of this. So City Hall has been helpful for us to think through some of these things and help us navigate um, all that process. And so the relationships have really been kind of 360 degree for us. Um, and so from funders, uh, to kind of government folks, to corporate people who are excited about it and have become, you know, supporters in terms of the scaled model and how we financially make that a, a sustainable model. Um, but again, also the relationships with the, you know, we're, we're embedded in um, a community that has 100 apartments surrounding our full service restaurant, Fire by Forge, and it will soon be 
the grocery store, as well as our training center, our kitchen training center. And so that's kind of the start of our our community for us is to kind of listen and, and learn from the people who live literally on our campus. And or more importantly, we do our work on their campus um, because it's 100 apartments right there. Um, and, you know, another couple of hundred within walking distance of where we are. So um, so those are all the different networks and people that we've tapped into and we're learning from and trying to to really um, listen, craft, learn, adjust um, as we go. Hi. So um, like I said about those listening sessions, what they created was relationships. So the first relationship we had were with the funders um, because they had the impetus to say we need to conquer this food access issue. Like Ben had, had said, if we don't or someone had said, if we don't uh, support our farms and our producers, where are we going to get our food from? So after funding, finding funding uh, relationships, we went to the farmers, we went to the producers. We wanted to know how they were getting their food to the masses and if they were, and was it only through CSAs and um, things like that? Did, were, there, were there any markets on the farms? Then we contacted and talked to um, bankers, people that fund businesses and fund farms to make sure that they are also able to fund us and support us. Then after that, we, we jumped right into ambassadors, which you could call community members as well. We call them ambassadors because for every person that shops in Rolling Grocer, their, their call would what is going to likely be to tell someone else. Once they've experienced it and seen the dollar save, the first thing they want to do is tell someone else. So they automatically become an ambassador. Um, and not necessarily that there's a payment involved in that. It's just really about making sure that, you know, if you treat people good and you give them exactly what they're looking for, what they need, they're going to run and tell everyone. That word that word of mouth is, is, is gold. It's diamonds. And we also have um, politicians that we look to. As we, New York has a, a huge farm bill and we have a lot of access and things going on in terms of how to support farmers. We wanted to make sure that the politicians knew what we were trying to do and how they could support us, how they could get things down the pipeline faster, if we could be at any speaking engagements to maybe to push the, the, the word about what was happening in our town, in our county. Um, and then we also had social services online and the aging services community um, leaders because they're the people that are, are in most closest to the pain, right? Those are the people that everyone goes to when they don't have anything and they can't figure out how to get X, Y, and Z. And so if we're tapped them in and we say, hey, we have this program, we have coupons, we have curbside, we have EBT acceptabilities, we have all these things, they're going to be the first ones to run and tell their, their constituents and their client populations, Rolling Gross is the one you need to go to because they've got your, you in mind. So those, that's our networking pool. And that's what we had at listening engagements. And we had all these community members and leaders all involved in the talks, radio shows, talk shows, whatever we could find that could, could push our, our narrative forward is who we used. You're probably going to see us on the news. I think we have Spectrum News and we're going to be on Fox News, not the most ideal, but controversially anyway, but we're going to be on those talks only to push the narrative of food access and food justice forward. Um, but we are, are definitely always seeking to make more partners and to build more community outside of our Columbia County uh, locale. Wow, I am so impressed by how thoughtful both of your organizations have been in reaching out and yeah, identifying what the community needs and wants um, and how you're making it happen. Um, with that being said, we kind of wanted to zoom out and think about here what equity uh, within our food system means to you and how you guys are really making sure that this is embodied within your programming. So uh, for us, we, we have equity, but we also have a big one we call di dignity. Um, uh, ben had mentioned somehow like using toast to kind of make sure no one knows what anyone else is, is affording. And we find dignity in, in, in the food uh, access world is lacking. Um, as people go forward, um, you know, they'll say, oh, you can use coupons and all stuff. Our, our logo is and our motto is you don't need coupons because the food's affordable, you know. You may not have to always look for a label because it's local. It's grown right here in your soil or right here in the eastern. So, you know, you can. We try to keep and source everything as much as we can local. Besides the obvious, big top sellers: bananas, avocados, lemons. Those things, you know, of course. But equity and dignity for us are tandem in in the work that we do. Um, we try to make sure it's um, it's paying a living wage. We don't try to um, find a lower tier to to buy our products from farmers. We want to pay them what they ask for. So that creates more sustainability for the farm and for the employees of the farm. We try to consider that every person that walks through our doors, whether they're a vendor, producer, or a customer, or just inquisitive, 
has the ability to understand, engage what is happening and what, what we're trying to do and how to push that narrative forward. Yeah, I love being uh, in this conversation together because there's so much alignment. Uh, to me, dignity really is the key word. And every step of the process, we've asked that, that question, right, is how do we make sure this is a dignified process? Because I really do believe that dignity um, gives the opportunity for hope, um, not the other way around. And I used to always say when I ran the soup kitchen that we weren't in the calorie delivery business, we were actually in the dignity and hope business. Um, and so we've taken that same approach here. On the equity front, I, again, I, I could cannot affirm more that we need to pay farmers what they actually need to sustain them. Our system, you know, we really have integrated because we have a full service restaurant, job, culinary training program and catering operation. So it allows us to buy in higher volume. It allows us to use food that is no longer at its peak best. We can move it along in that chain and still use it. It also gives us opportunity to do things like guarantee certain buys from the farmers and know that we have multiple outlets to use that food so there's not waste. And so that's one piece of it and how we're sourcing and taking care of our partners on that level. And to me, local is isn't just about where food is grown, but also where we're investing our dollars back into the economy, right? And we want to make sure that we're doing that locally as well. Um, we also are working hard to create a, a model where the people that work for us are making living wages. So we're doing some interesting things at the restaurant. We haven't quite figured out how to make that work in the store, um, but we're committed to getting there. And then uh, in terms of the, the the process of the store, the equity is, you know, again, the, the dignity of the process to make sure, uh, and it's funny, we're not using that color system, uh, but it's a similar model. So our markup in general is about 50%. So the 50% discount is our at cost. Um, and so uh, we want to make sure that food is available, that people can, can get the things they need. We also emphasize choice. And so, um, and that includes making choices that like you and I might not make or someone else might not make. So again, it's not a health food store, um, but we will use a system to indicate how to make better choices, but it's about giving people the choices to make. And, and, you know, sometimes when I go shopping, I buy things I know I'm not really supposed to eat, but that's okay. And I'm allowed to do that. And, and everything applies to the same discount. We're not just doing it for certain foods, right? Even though we want people to access healthier foods, um, the dignity piece and the equity piece says that everything in the store, whether it's stuff that our trainees have done in terms of prepared meals or homemade breads and dressings or cakes or those kind of things, everything in the store um, is the same process. We didn't want to get into saying, oh, no, only these items are available right on the discount, right? That doesn't make any sense. And that that fights the dignity piece and the equity piece. And so really we're thinking through really every piece of the puzzle. We had to think through how we issue the, the cards. How do we make sure the process works seamlessly so no one feels awkward about it? We had to think about you know, uh, asking for as little information as possible, right? So we didn't want people to have to come like with piles of bills and this and that. So it's a total self-certification with some guidelines and we're going to trust people and we're going to build a system around the 99% of people who are going to be honest and, and and need help and will do that versus the 1% who are always going to abuse the system. And that's always true, right? I mean, we run a loyalty program at the restaurant and you know what, there's always someone who tries to abuse it. Um, and so one of the fun things, by the way, is a little side note, we're actually using a parallel loyalty program in the grocery store because we're using the same POS system. So one of the things that means is for every dollar spent, you earn a point. When you earn a certain number of points, you get free stuff that you can actually get in the store or in the restaurant. So one of our hopes for the restaurant, which is a pretty high end upscale casual restaurant, is that people who wouldn't normally be able to eat in restaurants like that can also now earn points to be able to do that and do some things, some fun things. So we're really trying to integrate both those businesses on the dignity and equity front. And and really, that's important to us. Thank you, Ben. I forgot all about our food justice program with the food as well. We use our we have a prepared foods line that uses only the stuff that's shrinking out of our produce, and you know stuff that the farmers want to get rid of at a certain cost. We turn that into meals. Um, what POS system do you use, Ben? Uh, so toast is our POS. Okay, okay. We use our uh, ECRS, okay. which catapult. Hmm. Gosh, so excellent. Um, so we're going to move on to our last um, structured question, which is around values. And obviously, both of you have responded all of, uh, you know, with with values at at at, at the core and, and clearly your your work is centered around 
um, not only your own values, but obviously shared values within your community. Um, but let's just call that out a little bit. Um, so this work integrates the, the divergent food systems, as Sydney was saying, um, you know, charity, a charity system and commodity. Um, so what are the values that drive you in this work? Um, and how do you hold yourself accountable to them? And you being your, you know, your um, network of, of thought partners. And how do you balance being economically viable versus providing a service um, in the community? And, and that's actually a, a, a question that I've been and been holding. And if you can touch on um, what role, just to add on that, what role does philanthropy play? Um, does grant funding play? And can you be, um, you know, self-sufficient, you know, with or with or without it? And, and what is the sustain economic sustainability of that? Those are a lot of questions right there. Yeah, um, I, kinda, I kind of added that extra one because I think it kind of ties in a little bit. And if it's too sure. much, just separate it out. That's okay. Let me start there because um, social enterprise business is kind of at the core of our mission and has always been the tool we use. And we're always really clear that it, uh, the social enterprise businesses are the tool um, and not the, the tail that wags the dog, so to say. So, you know, in our job training, we use the restaurant, the catering, and eventually the grocery store will be our laboratories for learning. And so the job training we fully integrated into the businesses as it already is with catering and, and the restaurant. Um, and by social enterprise, all we mean is that there's a double bottom line, right? Is that there's a social capital bottom line, but there also has to work economically. Um, and in our accounting, we do try to figure out what's program versus what's enterprise so that we can do that. And our organization, our approach is we are happy and we try to fund program. Um, and then the business has to work on its own to at least a break even. So this coming year, for example, earned income, which is, you know, the, the stuff that comes through our social enterprises uh, will be uh, about half of our operating budget. So we're, we're looking at about a $4 million budget as, a, as an organization, and a, we'll bring in about $2 million to $2.2 million in earned income as part of that. So the rest of it, obviously, we go out and raise. Um, we tend to use that money for things like startups and or ongoing programmatic expenses that we can pre predict and budget. So um, the model for us will be that we will continue to raise some philanthropy dollars to kind of to support the sliding scale model. Um, but we've also structured it again so that uh, over the time as we grow volume and get a mixed group of people who are shopping, which is one of our values around the whole destigmatization that we want to have a variety of people, a diversity of people shopping, is that again, using the baseline of kind of a 50% markup that so all the food that's going out at the discount levels are going out at cost. Um, and so it does protect us a little bit to make sure that the business works, if that makes sense. Um, and so, but we, we at least for the first couple of years, are raising some money to help support that process. Um, in terms of the values, again, and dignity, uh, the, the power of food to be transformative, um, and the nature of community and neighborhood and listening. Um, for us, DEIB uh, all across the board. So, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging are really core to who we are as an organization. So making sure that um, it's not just the diversity and equity, but also the inclusion and belonging in the process. So we put together, we're putting together kind of an advisory team from the neighborhood that will be an ongoing part of our governance structure at the grocery in terms of evaluating what we're stocking and different products and different approaches and all those kinds of things. So we're really trying to think very intentionally about building our core values in at every step of the equation. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, it was a really long question. Could you would you mind paraphrasing this oh, a little bit? Of course. Bit? Yes, of course. Well, you know what I'm gonna do actually is just break it up into um I'm just gonna stick with the values question because Okay. So um so this is on values. And um so this work integrates the divergent food systems, both the charity and the uh commodity. And what are the values that drive you in this work? And how do you hold yourself accountable to them? So we'll take that and then I can ask the second part of the question. Sure. Um, so I guess um, one person had phrased it that this is a social, this is a socialist movement. This is a movement that's, food, you know, it's, it's really social in its practice. And I said, yes, it has to be because humans need food as much as foods need human. Um, you know, the value of having a store that 
meets the needs of its community is is a social um it's un, it's it's un, in, invaluable socially but we would always need funding we would always need support for um the philanthropic part part of it because as much as you you sow that social soil of uh community and support um and, and accessibility, you have to, there, there's a negative that's happening because you're not living like um, the shop rights and the price choppers and the, the whole foods of the world. Um, so we, we account for that with philanthropic dollars. Um, we need about 25% of donations in the program at, to date um, to support the program, to keep it going, to pay a living wage, to be able to access the food. And I'm, I failed to mention our, our biggest relationship outside of all those others, which is um, fiscally sponsored uh, supports. So we're, we're not for profit, not yet, but we're fiscally sponsored first by a program that was also brought out of love and social soil. So Hawthorne Valley Farm Store um, is, a, is a, a farm store that is 100%, uh, you know, like for profit, but they have a buying power and that buying power allowed us to be able to tack onto them and get a discount, get food at such a discounted rate that we pass the food on, it's, it's less than what it would be at, at any of the stores that anyone can go to. And so that, that created for us the, um, the exact perfect storm of, of social justice. Um, so the value for us is always going to be in relationships and communities and in the pain that comes with um, inaccessibility of things. Um, the pain that comes from having a question and not being able to quite answer it right but knowing that because you have people that are also in the work, it's getting answered in bits and pieces. And those bits and pieces are what, what drive us and keep us going forward. Um, when you have families that are saying to you that they haven't eaten, eaten this well since the 80s, you know, that's huge. Um, we prioritize uh, keeping costs low. We don't dictate what people are going to eat, but we do have a mission. And that mission allows us to consider the earth as our first valuable commodity. It's the biggest, even before the people, right? Because if we don't treat the earth right and we don't consider what we're buying and how we're packaging things, then you know, we, we, our grandkids, our legacy won't be around. So we don't buy things that are pretty much you know, uh, prepackaged in a lot of plastic. Um, we have a bulk section that allows for folks to buy things at bulk, bringing their containers in. Um, we also utilize um, minimal, minimally processed foods as a secondary to organic. Um, not everyone can afford organic. And organic is is ideal, but we can't, again, we can't preach to people as to what the value of food is. We don't food shame, in other words. Um, similar to having ugly vegetables come in because they're local, we don't consider the perfect fruit or the per perfect vegetable to be what we want in our bins. We want them all in the bin. Um, so we, we consider value to be all the things that make up what it takes to grow a thing, and not just uh, what it takes to afford it, right? Um, because a lot of people can afford food, but is it going to grow? Is it going to be a blessing? Is it going to be beneficial? So that's my answer for that one. Wow. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> I want to open up the floor to uh, questions. Uh, people can unmute themselves or you could post something in the chat um, and I would be happy to read it. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sally. You feel that way also. Mm. Yeah. I think we're all just sort of taking in. It's just like such, um, yeah, powerful work. Have either of you guys considered opening a franchise in Eastern Connecticut? <laughs> that would be great. We are looking to consider opening it um, in a Southern part of uh, New York. So not quite all the way down like in Orange County, but um, just South of here in Kingston, which is Ulster County, which would have been the first um, capital of New York actually. So yeah, we're looking at that right now. Hi, um, my name is Hope John and I, I, I'm, really really uh grateful to join this uh, uh you know today's meeting i'm learning i'm open i'm 
professor in, at UConn. I'm leading uh, some community nutrition intervention project. And then, you know, I met Sydney for, you know, through the developing some project uh, food resource map, and then she helped a lot. And, uh, you know, I have one question about, you know, what your your whole entire team is doing, you know, I'm interested in kind of a next level of my project. I'm thinking of um, connecting some food system and also environmental sustainability because uh, as a part of our project, I we, my team did uh, some kind of a food price, uh, you know, um, investigation in the, our local groceries. And then what they found is, uh, in my, you know, our study area is Wyndham County. We have a lot of um, Hispanic population and small size of uh, ethnic food groceries. Those groceries actually relatively uh, price is higher. It's, uh, you know, it's a uh, very, you know, understandable because uh, their buying power is uh, smaller, so they cannot compete with uh, large grocery stores. But still, a lot of uh, this, uh, our local people prefer those, area, those uh, stores because uh, they more feel welcoming. They, you know, we go to the local, you know, local community and talk with the people. Many people, you know, do not that much like, uh, you know, big, grocery stores, so they feel like uh, they are not that much welcoming them. And then they prefer Aldi or, you know, local ethnic groceries. So, you know, I thought, uh, you know, is there any way we can connect those, uh, enhance those groceries, you know, connecting to local farming. And then also uh, another way is, uh, I also think about environmental sustainability. You know, in a in a long term, we also need to consider some. You know, that's very important. So I wonder, in your your project, do you have any component considering this uh, uh, environmental sustainability? I'll say from our end, uh, we do take under consideration all those kind of factors. It is about balancing different things. So like, you know, we've had to prioritize as we're beginning to think about stocking and what that looks like, our priority is to get affordable, wholesome food on the shelves. Um, and so, but we also are looking at sustainability issues. It's one of the reasons we want to do as much with local produce and all those kinds of things as possible. We do consider things like packaging and all those kinds of things as well. Um, and we've been lucky that um, we've also, in terms of our grocery stuff, um, one of the big um, vendors is actually excited about our project. So normally they don't work with small grocery stores, but we are able to work with them. So we'll actually be able to take advantage of some better buying power than we might otherwise. We're also able to combine our purchases with the restaurant and the catering. Um, and so it allows us to buy at a higher volume, um, which also is helpful. I see. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Anak. So um, it's it's a huge issue. Branding is a huge issue. We try to figure out how to tackle branding as well, even with the, the buying power of a, a bigger grocery store that's supporting us and giving us their discount. Um, you know, one of the things we thought about was just letting people try things, challenge them. So we challenge folks, whatever sauce you use, we're going to challenge you to try this sauce. You know, uh, we tried a bunch of different options for people. We tried a bunch of different ways to make sure that they knew that even though they were they were tied into Hellman's, that this Woodstock, you know, some mayonnaise, which had the which had better ingredients, it had a more wholesome brand. If they tried it, if they tried it with their children, you know, hide it in a box and use it and just let them use it. If they just took away the, the brand new, even the label, they would find that they found something more nutritious, more tasty, and there wouldn't be much difference actually in in the two flavors. So we challenge people to say that to them. Unless you had stock in a thing, it didn't make sense to commit wholly to it unless you were willing to branch out a little bit. It's almost like moving to a new neighborhood, right? Every every neighborhood has houses, cars buildings and people but you know like your neighborhood you're saying is the best neighborhood i challenge you to say that maybe every neighborhood is good it just depends on who knows you in that neighborhood so we did a lot of our rebranding um marketing we did a lot of challenges to the community to get them on side because to afford the cost of kellogg's and all these other companies we looked at it they wanted um i'm not lying to you they wanted like a twenty five thousand dollar buying commitment every every time you bought who could so one of the things we have in our model is um, low, low, low <laughs> overhead. And by that, we mean we're not going to have 18 cans of black beans because we can get it on sale 
for 25% off. We don't, we don't, as a head buyer, I don't do that. Um, you know, we buy case by case. If there's a case minimum of three, okay, we'll go to that. But we're not trying to um, put ourselves in a debt just to meet the, the, the mirage of branding, because that's where you're going to find the crux of most of what you're talking about is um, we do have a large Bangladesh population, Spanish population, um, but, you know, there's also gentrification happening. But within all of that, we, we know that if people try it and they trust it and they trust us, which building trust is invaluable, um, they're willing to come to the table more. And, you know, produce for one of the things doesn't have any branding or labels on it. So we can get them in with really good produce, really local produce, really clean produce in terms of clean as in like, you know, it's, it's organic or it's low spray IPM, but it's good and it's cost effective they'll come on side with other things. We have teenagers that come off the bus from school and come in our grocery store because they won't buy snacks at the corner store anymore. And I don't know if that's, if that's breaking a generational curse in my book. So. Sydney, are you going to take the questions? In the yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm making sure that I'm starting at like the first one. So Chelsea uh, asked for the listening sessions, um, did you offer incentives for those who joined? Sorry, I did answer that one, but then I realized, oh, maybe they're going to go through and read them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll answer for any, everyone else. Yes, yeah, so we did. We paid a stipend to every person that was going to join. Um, and it was it was $250 um, per um, every quarter that we paid for them to come in and um, be a part of the listening sessions. And they were they were fed. Um, there was a hot meal provided. And, you know, there was there was um quick quiz time that was incorporated into it. So while we're in there talking and being really serious about food and numbers and access and how things look, we were also offering like little incentives. Like if anyone can get the answer for this in Columbia County, you might win a prize, you know? So we, we kind of offered community and like, you know, a way to like bring people together that normally wouldn't come together. Um, you know, one of the other things we did is our first in, initial endeavor was a, a mobile grocery store. You might say, why is it called Rolling Grocer? We were going around, rolling around on a trailer for a year before this, before actually getting a brick and mortar. We went to different communities because we knew that there were fissures. So different communities don't talk to each other. And so that's why the listening sessions help because now you have somebody on Front Street, you have someone on Third, you have someone on Fifth, you have someone on Warren Street. You, you bring all these people together and now they realize that they have more in common than they have differences. Sure, everybody's wallets are different, but we all have to eat. So we try to find commonalities and ways to pull people in and we use the language of what speaks to them. Are you looking to save money on food? Are you looking for local foods and you're looking for cleaner food? So every community had a different impetus as to why they were there. And everyone came because of that. So the call was different for every every demographic. But in the end, it was all food, which was the unifying factor. And a quick answer for us is we feed people. Yeah. We've done cash incentives, but we do feed them off. Um, I kind of have a follow up for that. Um, as you guys are starting to launch um, in like a post COVID era, how has that leveling of engagement really changed? I mean, we're all sitting on Zoom right now. Um, there's not as many in person opportunities, I feel like, as there used to be. Uh, do you find it's harder to gauge community um, that way? Uh, I'll, I'll say for, oh, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, this question is more related to him, right? Because he's starting up, not not rolling grocer. Yeah, but I'm happy to hear anyone's insight. <laughs> well, we were trying to gauge an, an advisory board because in order to become a 51C3, you have to have a board. So we were trying to engage an, an advisory board. And we found that during COVID and even after, Zoom worked really well. Google Meets worked really well. We kind of met people where they were because Zoom sometimes is a paid platform. It says a, a limited uh, number of minutes that you can be on something. Data poverty is real. So we also had that as a, as a, as a factor. And we, so we chose watering holes also, places that we knew that everybody in the community went to that they felt comfortable with that was borderless, meaning no matter what you what, what, what walk of life you came from, documented or undocumented, you could, you, in this space, it was, it was safe. And so we chose places like that to have um, sessions and, and engagement and continue that because it's not once you're a brick and mortar, you stop listening. The listening just changes, right? And so we continue to do that work. We continue to be of, of value to the community by listening and changing what we're doing so that it meets the needs of our folks. You know, um, If that means changing the membership form or changing um, the music, whatever it is gonna be, we're, we're, we're tapped in so much that we wanna make sure that it's the right environment for everyone. Uh, one person had mentioned they wanted everyone to wear name tags and they didn't know who everyone was. And we put that out to our 3000 and some odd 
our constituents and everyone said no we know who everybody is it's small enough <laughs> so that person was only with us for six months and they thought you know they needed a name tag now they know everyone and everyone knows them it's like cheers <laughs> you know for us we've engaged a lot of different approaches a lot of it's been conversations at our farmer's market for example so people who already we have a relationship with or you know, something that will be an impromptu sit down conversation. I'd sit down with three people who are shopping there. We also were lucky, uh, Leadership Greater Hartford, um, their Quest project did, a, did some research with us. So we had a team of folks from Leadership Greater Hartford who did some door to door knocking and some surveying, multilingual surveying. Um, and so we were able to do it that way. And then we did a couple kind of more formal focus group type things. Um, and so we used a variety of different ways uh, to connect with people. Thank you. Um, we do have another question from Rex. Um, so rolling grocer will require a 25% annual operating subsidy. Uh, what is the annual budget and square footage of the store? Sheesh, Rex. Those are really heavy questions. Um, <laughs> we have a, a money person that handles that, but I do know the square footage of the store is 1,200 square feet. Um, that's on the sales floor. We do have 300 square foot of uh, back storage space, staff dining space in an office. That's probably about 150 square feet. Um, so that's the makeup of the sales floor is about 1,200 square feet. So it's not huge, but we've been able to use um, a grant to get a designer to come in and give us the most optimal. We, we looked at a bunch of different floor pans to figure out what was the most optimal. So we've changed. We're in the fifth iteration of our, our floor plan right now. And there was another question about, was this, what was the other part of the question? Something about requiring a 25% annual operating subsidy or? Yeah. So what we did is after the, the, the initial half a million dollars that we got from the grant, we, we, we realized that to keep it going, we'd have to continue funding. We couldn't really hire a grant writer because we just didn't have the means and the money to do so. What we did have is a, a small network of funders that were interested in the work, that were volunteers that were coming in, that were people that were just giving cash injections. Of, we, we got a, a, a fully equipped, um, transit van that we got paid for by, by a donor. So what we did is we tapped every donor and said, okay, we know that you know donation time is like all the time for every organization. What about if you commit to a small amount of money over a certain number of years? So if every donor gave $25,000 every year for a certain number of years, we, we quantified that by how much money we would need per year, per capita, per annual in terms of staffing um, and any other additional, it's usually admin stuff that usually needs the, and labor that we need to float for. So we, we figured that out. We had a numbers person figure that out and we came up with a number. We divided that number times five. And that number is what we use to bring to every donor to say, if you give us 25, you give us 25, you give us 25. And that seemed more manageable. And they could break it up into any kind of 5,000 a month. They could do it in 5,000 every quarter. As long as at the end, it was $25,000 that we got from every donor, we were able to secure funding for the next five years with that. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? I have a lot, but I don't want to like hog the space. Okay. Um, so, Sila, earlier you were talking about the colors, um, the tier system. Roughly what percentage of customers fall into each uh, tier? And does that really correlate to the... Um, the demographics of the community you're serving? Do you guys find you're reaching a much higher percentage of low incomes than are low income individuals than maybe are proportional to the, your community or yeah, what does that breakup look like? Sure, this is a great question. So here's the shocker folks. The blue tier is the lowest tier that's being occupied. And that might be because of um, gentrification, but blue tier is the lowest tier being occupied um, with about I want to say 33% of the clientele shopping in the blue tier. The other two tiers, orange and green, take up the bulk of that. Um, and that's probably because we also have, we're on the Amtrak line. I don't know if you know what that's like, but when you're on the Amtrak line, um, typically you're getting people up here all the time, tourists shopping all the time. And so we have a large number of people shopping in the green. They're not able to register as an actual member because they don't live in the area. So that along with about seven or eight hotels that came online, during COVID has given us that boost of green injection. So it's actually brought down our need for more philanthropic cash flow because we've been able to stabilize our tourism uh, green tier price. So that's that's the answer for that one. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, and similarly, Ben, I know you guys are doing projection stuff right now. Have you guys tried to look at like what's your ideal spot of how many people are paying the wholesale rate or versus how many people are paying that 50% markup? So that's like the big question that we, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, and it's projection at this point. And honestly, most of the vast majority of people that we're signing up right now are, are at the 50%, which is the highest discount. But that's not to be surprised because we've been targeting our own farmer's market where people have been doing double snap and all those kind of things. And we did a bunch of pop-up markets until we open in a similar kind of situation where we're doubling snaps. That's where we've been drawing. Um, our best guess is that we're going to need to be... Um, almost even thirds to, you know, but again, we will supplement as needed. And so uh, to me, the, the importance of the mix is less about financial sustainability than creating the kind of community that is really important. So um, we'll have to do a lot of marketing and target outreach to kind of the, the full paying folks, I think, and convince them that the quality of the food is why they should come shop. And it's not just because it's a, you know, a good program. Um, and so to have that mix is really important. The advantage I think we have and we're hoping will play out is, again, we have a high-end restaurant that attracts, you know, people from Aetna and Travelers and the Hartford and we're walking distance to the Capitol and, and those kind of things. So those are folks who are already utilizing our restaurant and our catering pretty regularly and are on our campus. So we're hoping to convince them that they should also stop by to pick up their groceries, you know, while they're there and need to create that kind of mix. But that's one of the big question marks. And in a year, I can come and give you some information. Thank you. It's I love that both of you mentioned kind of this tourism destination stop. That's not something that I think we had really been considering before in these talks. And it sounds like it's been beneficial for both programs. Does anyone have any other questions or? This has been such a thorough and thoughtful conversation. <laughs> it's like. I know. I'm looking forward to taking field trips to both of these places. Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Okay, I guess um, we should probably start wrapping it up then. Um, I just want to say thank you to both of our guests. Um, I've learned so much tonight and thank you to everyone for coming and also to our organizers, Allie, Sally, and Meg. And you'll be hearing from us with the recording and a recap. Yes. Sure. Um, there was a question, or someone had put a, a comment in the chat about um, accessibility in terms of transportation yeah and we we have um we're in the seat of the, of the county so we're really dense and there was another there's another town that's about 30 miles just about right at the 30 mile point which is new lebanon which is right on the border between berkshire massachusetts and us and um and they were having challenges getting in because they were carpooling at that point the nearest grocery store for them was 25 minutes away so what we did is we partnered with a food, um, what is it called? Farmer's market. Farmer's market was all year round up there, but they only could provide uh, produce and, and um, meat. And so we provided the grocery. We went into, com we went into um, com uh, community conversations with them and said, if we could bring in our grocery to add to your meat and your, and your produce, would that be okay? And so we were able to put a store within the New Lebanon farmer's market and be able to offer canned goods, bulk, pre-bag bulk, um, dairy, all the things that they couldn't offer at the farmer's market, we were able to inject into them and we were all be able to use our fair pricing system with those products only and the double up food bucks. So, and EBT, which at the time that farmer's market, the EBT input intake was like 15%. Once we got in there, it jumped up to 50% because people were able to do a, a more wholesome shop. So the more things that they can glean and get from, the, the higher they're gonna, the more they're gonna populate it and do the thing, right? So I would say for anyone thinking about this work, um, think about all the departments um, and, you know, think about starting small. We started with three days a week from 11 to seven, and now we're seven days a week on uh, nine to seven. And that took uh, five years. Thank you. Hey, I think I've, I'm sorry I missed that one, but I think I've gotten everything else now. <laughs> Um, yeah, as Ali was saying, we will 
send out an email with this recording as well as some notes. Um, there was a couple great resources listed today. Um, so we're hoping to go back and kind of link those into the notes for everyone as well. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Uh, happy Thanksgiving if you celebrate. Um, Thanks. It's been great. And I appreciate you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a great Thank night. Thank you so much. Ben, good luck. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, do you want to stay on just for a minute? Yeah. And then we can stop recording. Yeah. Let me uh, do that. Ah. Gosh.